make sure we understand uh, where we're at. First, a couple of just housekeeping things. Um, this is week seven. Next week is week eight. Do you see how I did that in my head? I didn't even have to count on my fingers or pull out a sheet of paper and add it. What does that mean? Week eight is when the first part of your portfolio is done. So this week your lab six is due. Next week you should turn in your portfolio, which should include a homepage. It minimally should include a homepage with links to uh, your first six assignments. So there is not a new homework assignment beyond the portfolio for next week. The week after that is spring break. And then there will be a uh, assignment due the week we get back from spring break. Uh, but it will be due Wednesday, so if you want to just relax over spring break and not work on anything, that's fine. You'll have a few days, and plus you could work on it early. All right, so that's kind of how uh, it is. Um, your design for your project is due early in April, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember the exact date. But it's getting to be where you should start to think about it. We've covered the design uh, process and, and what we want in the design document. It's definitely not early to start thinking about it and start working on it. You can always show me what you want or what you have and let me know what, what you plan on doing, what you want to do, and I'll let you know if it's okay, if it needs to be broadened or if it needs to be narrowed. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is what? Oh, and this applies for anything, whether it be a project or whether it be a homework assignment. Um, and I don't get it so much in this class. I get it sometimes in my programming classes. Uh, but if you're unsure about something, if, you, if you're not sure what you have to do or, or you're experiencing a difficulty or whatever, don't turn it into the Dropbox. Email it to me. The Dropbox is meant for when you think you've completed the assignment. All right? So if you're sure that you have not completed the assignment because you're not sure what to do or because you're having difficulty with something, then don't turn it into the Dropbox and put a note there. The reason for that is, you know, I fall behind grading and I won't get to answer you as quickly as I would like to. Uh, if you email it to me, uh, you'll get quicker attention. Uh, so if you want quick, instantaneous feedback on something, email it to me as opposed to post it to the Dropbox. Post it to the Dropbox, I assume that as near as you know, it's completely correct and you fully expect to get full credit on it. If there's any question, then email it to me. Okay, so what we've been doing is we went through the design process of the, the different stages, and one of the stages was a wireframe, which is just very bare bones uh, appearance of what the page should look like. And now we are going to start taking and making a prototype from the wireframe. And we're going to make the prototype by doing this. We're going to create two files. We're going to create a template file, and we're going to create a template HTML file, and we're going to create CSS files. All right? Then, when we're happy with the template, we are going to clone that template for each of the pages in our prototype, and then we'll make the, we'll code the differences in the prototype. Now, your template's going to have sections of the page that you are going to want to be the same on every page. You're going to try your best to get those right. Because once you clone it and have four or eight or however many copies of that page, if you want to go back and change the common content, you have to change it in eight places or four places or three places or whatever. You don't have that problem with CSS, remember, because all our CSS's code is going to be in one file. So if you decide, hey, I want that red to be a little darker, well, it's not that big a deal. You just change it, and all the pages reflect that. But if you say, well, I want uh, an additional link on my navigation. I forgot about something, and I need an additional link on my navigation. Well, after you've cloned it to make your other prototype pages, you have to go back and then change each one of your prototype pages 
to account for that change to the common area. So where we went off last time is we were not really done with the template, but we made some progress with the template, and we're going to uh, continue making that. The other thing that we're doing in this section, besides talking about making a template, making a prototype, is we're really going to attempt to extend our knowledge of CSS. And we started out last time talking about the box model, which you can Google it. There's a lot of good resources. I talked about it last time. Just to review, the box model of CSS says the following, that every block tag on your page is a box. And we can set a number of different properties for that box. And those properties include a border. It includes a margin. It includes padding. And it includes a height and width. If you omit any of these, you go back to the browser defaults. So let's look at what we've done in these boxes here. In the HTML, it's going to look very plain. Just header, nav, section, and footer. If we look at the CSS, we'll see that each of our boxes have sort of the same thing. First thing I did is I put this in here to remove all the margins to get rid of all the default, default margins, because I want to set the margins myself. So a good way to do that is if you do asterisk, uh, then margin zero pixels, you can control the margin of everything. All right. I have the same thing for each one of them. Background of silver, so it's a background color, with 600 pixels, border 5px black solid, and padding 15px. Now I want to go over what are kind of shortcuts for uh, setting properties. Some of these properties are actually a combination of several properties. They're just a shortcut. For example, border, there's actually several properties. There's a border width a border color, and a border style. So I could do this. And I'll just go and change this for the header section. And you'll notice it will be exactly the same. These are actually separate properties. three separate properties for border, maybe a couple others, but the three main ones are border width, border color, border style. So I can set them individually like this, border width, border color, and border style. And if I do that, you'll notice there'll be no difference here. All right. But notice what I did last time, and what I usually do is I just say border, colon, and then 5px black and solid. The browser is smart enough to know that 5px can only refer to a width. All right, 5px isn't any kind of coding for a color. So the browser knows that's not a color. It knows that black can't be a width, and black isn't a style of border. Um, and it knows solid can't be a width or can't be a color. So it knows just from context that 5px must be the width, black must be the color, and solid must be the border style. So you'll see a lot of properties like this where you can write them all out individually the long way, 
or you can use a shortcut like this. I don't really care which way you use, all right? It is good to know that both ways exist, simply from the viewpoint of uh, even if you only use one of them, if you see another way of doing it in an example, or if you're working on a project with another developer and they use a different style than you do, you should be able to recognize that. Even background is actually a shortcut for background color. Because you can actually specify a background color and you can specify a background URL. All right? And by omitting color, it's smart enough to know, well, did you say background URL or, or did you say, did you include a URL here or did you include a color here? So it knows what property it is based on whether the value you give it makes sense as a color or if the value you give it makes sense as a URL. So you can either specify them individually or you can use these shortcut properties. And if you're not sure, you can always look it up. Like if we look CSS background, if we look here, these are actually all the properties that you can set on a background. Color, an image, I said URL, but I meant image. Repeat, attachment, and position. So background color, background image. And you can repeat that image horizontally, vertically, or both. And finally, you have a short ground, shorthand property where if you say background, it knows that that is the color, this is the image, this is the repeat, this is the position, and so on. So you have all of these separate properties that you can set individually or you can use a shorthand property. All right, And that's like that for a lot of different things. It's like that for margin and padding as well. Because really, when we talk about margin or padding, there's four directions around the box, right? But when looking at margin or padding or border for that matter, there is a top, there is a right, there is a bottom, and there is a left. So I can treat those individually. Notice, let's look at this paragraph here. And in my code, I have for that section padding 15 pixels. Because I've only specified one number, it gives me 15 pixels in all directions. So 15 on the top, 15 on the right, 15 on the bottom, 15 on the left. And that's the sequence that things go, right? It works clockwise starting at the top. So I can actually specify there's actually, for padding, there's actually four properties. Padding, and same thing for border width, and same thing for uh, margin, and same thing for padding. So I could say padding dash, and I'll make it dramatic, 15 pixels. Padding top. 50 pixels, padding right, um, 2 pixels, padding bottom, 25 pixels. So if we look at this, the padding is different in each direction. The top has a 50 pixel padding, this has a 2 pixel padding, this has a 5 pixel padding, I think I did, and this has a 20 or whatever I said for, for the bottom padding. So I can set them all individually. 
If I use a shortcut and just say padding 50px, then it will be that padding in all four directions. Oops. No. I have to say padding. We still have padding left too. Though. Right. 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 So if I say padding 50px, that's actually padding in all four directions. Now, you can also specify pairs of numbers. And if you specify pairs of numbers, again, you're going to start clockwise, or you're going to start at the top of the clock, you're going to start at the top, and then go clockwise. So if I say padding 0px, 50px, the way it works is the top padding will be 0px, the right padding will be 50px, the bottom padding will be 0px again, because we ran out of numbers, and then the left padding will be 50px. All right, so top and bottom are 0, right and left are 50. If I even give a third number, top, right, bottom, and then left, so the top will be 0px, the right will be 50px, the bottom will be 10px, and the left will be 0px. Or not. Okay, I stand corrected. It used 50 for the right and left. If you use 3, it just confuses it. I always thought you could use three and it would loop around, but I guess I'm wrong. If you specify only two, it uses the first for the top and bottom. It uses the second for the right and left. If you use three, it will ignore the third. If you use four, it will use them in sequence, top, right, bottom, left. So if I say 20 pixels and then five pixels, Top, right, bottom, left. Top, right, bottom, left. Really doesn't make any sense to use three of them anyhow. So um, I guess I wouldn't even consider that a bug because it's confusing. So margins like this, padding is like this, border is like this. So where I actually have border width, that's actually itself a shortcut for border width top, border width bottom, border, border width left, border width right. I think, I hope I got them all. So if I wanted only a border on the bottom, if I wanted a line underneath it, I could do border width bottom border color bottom well let's do that let's see what it says that should give me just the border underneath
make the border zero pixels left, right, and top, and make a five pixel bottom. So there's a border underneath it, but not in the other directions. I could also make it a different color in other directions if I wanted to by saying border color or border top col uh, color red, border right color green, and so on down the line. So all those things, again, you have a lot of power here, all right, on what you can do. So what you, can, what you should do is do something that help, that you think helps communicate the message of your page and not simply to show off your, your mad CSS skills. You can also round the corners of the border, all right, which kind of gives a nice uh, effect as well. Let me make sure we got this one back to normal. So CSS. Rounded borders, rounded corners, not borders. You can specify a border radius. So I could say on this, border radius 10 pixels. And that curves it. The higher number that we give it, the, the more of a curve it's going to be. If you gave it a negative number, would it end it? I don't know. Tim Berners-Lee comes and yells at you <laughs> if you do that. We'll try it, sure. What's the worst that will happen? I mean, it's not going to break our computer, I don't think. So that's very rounded because I gave a very high number. What if we give a negative number? My guess is a negative number will be, um, it'll act as though it's zero, and it'll act like just as a square corner. But I got, I got to say, I've never been asked that question before. So let's make it negative 10. Yeah. So there we go on that. Okay. So we can. Uh, there's a little bit more that we can do with that. Remember the shortcut properties, uh, and you can you can corner the uh, radius of the. Uh, you can you can round the radius, or you can round the corners of uh, things. All right. <clears throat> Next, we're going to do is we're going to play a little bit with the margin of this, all right? Because this is kind of stuck on the, the page like a postage stamp, all right? Or a sticker, it's kind of stuck on the corner of the page. We want to kind of center this a little bit, all right? So, I can specify a margin, and let's think about what margins I want. I want the header to have the header and the footer to have a top and bottom margin respectively. I want to bring it down from the very top of the page. And I want to give a little bit of gap at the very bottom of the page. Okay, So I'll give the to a top margin of the, uh, of the um, give a top margin of the, uh, for the top I'll give a bottom margin for, for the top margin for the header, bottom margin for a footer, and both of them I'm going to do a right and left margin. All right, so let's let's do that. So I'm going to say margin, and I could do this margin top, left, bottom, right, and all that, but I'm going to say margin 50 px.
100 px, 0 px, 100 px. So, for the top thing, for the header, I want the top margin to be 50, the right margin to be 100, the bottom margin to be 0, and the left margin to be 100 pixels. So if I do this, that's what I get. Top and pushed over. Now it's not wide enough to fill up the whole screen, so it, uh, it gives more than 100 on the right. It's still right up next to the navigation, which was, was, was what I said I wanted to do. Okay? Let's do this to all of these. Except I want the bottom or the top margin for these to be zero and the bottom margin for the footer to be a hundred pixels. So a little bit of space at the bottom. All right. So it's not it's not awkwardly sort of stuck at the end. All right, stuck at the in the top corner. There's some rhyme and reason to it. Now, I used absolute number of pixels here. So if I make it really small the content area doesn't move at all. And I did that for both the margins and the width. While it's okay to do that in some circumstances, generally speaking, you want your pages to be responsive. And we'll talk more about what responsive pages are, but essentially responsive pages adjust themselves to the size of the screen that you're dealing with. Okay? So instead of a absolute number of pixels, especially for the width, I'm going to use a percentage. So I'm going to say instead of 60 pixels, I'm going to say 600% or 60% rather. So I'll go and make all of these 60%. Since this has an approximately a width of 1,000 and some pixels, at full screen, it'll, it'll be roughly 600 pixels anyhow. So at full screen, the size will be the same as it was. But as I make the screen bigger and smaller, it resizes itself. Resizes itself until... It can't do it without cutting off any content. Like, at this point, it can't make it any smaller anymore. Because that would cut off the word photography and that would not honor the margin. I can make these margins percentages as well. So I can make a margin of let's say, well, let's do this. If I say auto, that will actually center it. So 50 pixels on the top, automatic on the right, zero on the bottom, auto on the left. For these, I'm going to say zero pixels auto, and that will automatically center it. So that is centered then. So the bigger the screen, the bigger your content area is. The smaller the screen, the smaller it gets. If we were to view this in a mobile device, 
by going to Developers Tools and click on this. We can see that's how it would look on these different mobile phones. Now, if you remember, we said that there's something we can put at the beginning, and we might as well make sure right away that that is... in there. So that goes in the head. Meta tags are simply a variety of tags about the page. And if we do this, Uh, it looks a little more readable if we have it on a phone with that in there. And that's how it looks in a desktop device. Now, depending on the particular circumstances and exactly what your page looks like, you might not want the page to collapse below a certain width, all right? In which case, you could put a minimum width on things. So I'm going to go into my CSS, and for each of these, I'm going to say minimum width. Let's see if that does anything here. I'll say minimum width of 300 pixels. So I'll make it 60% of the page, but I won't let it get smaller than 300 pixels. So it will get small to a certain point, and then it won't get any smaller than that. Because sometimes if you, depending on the content of your page and if you had images in there and so on, you could have things overlapping and you could have really crazy stuff happening. So you can prevent that by putting a minimum width on. Let's see how this looks in a mobile device now. Well, a little bit of it's cut off. So we could maybe adjust that. Maybe adjust the minimum width to be 200 pixels. See how that goes. mentioned, again, is by viewing it in a mobile device, uh, it helps you see what your page will look like in a, in a mobile device by viewing it that way. The other thing that you ought to do at this point, especially as we're getting into more into CSS, is view it in different browsers. All right? And we should also run our code through the validator. Uh, and I talked about validation in this class before, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I won't talk about that necessarily right now. But uh, you don't want to wait until you get to the end and get a bunch of nasty surprises, right? So I'm going to go, I'm going to open this with Firefox just to make sure that the page works correctly in Firefox, which it seems to. And let's open it in Edge. It does open it in Internet Explorer. And it does. 
So, let's run it through a validator too. Because we don't want to wait till we get an end to the, to the end. So I can put my code in here. Copy it, paste it in. And identifying headings to all sections. That's just a warning, all right? But what they want me to do is have something like this, a heading in that section, to describe what the contents of that section is. You don't have to, but the warning is kind of telling you, yeah, you might want to do this. that to be an H2 because I already had an H1 or yeah I had yeah it's weird at a certain point you can say I know what I'm doing I don't care what you say because it is just a warning but I just wanted to show a clean one with no errors we can also do by CSS as well. Maybe. Oh, here we go. So I'm going to put the minimum width back in. And I'm going to view it here. Congratulations, no air fall. They even give me a sticker to put on my page. Oh, we like stickers, right? So we'll put it on our page. now it should have gotten rid of the problems that we had when I added the minimum width. Well, sort of did. That, that doesn't look too bad. We can switch to different bones and see what it looks like. Okay. Doesn't cut off the side again. Doesn't scroll. All right. Let's see. What do we want to talk about next? Next thing I want to talk about is fonts, because I don't think we talked much about fonts in class. I do know that some people had questions in lab, and I kind of gave many lectures if people had questions in lab. And I know that some people worked ahead to see how to do some things differently and so on. So that's really cool. But I, there's a few things I definitely want to cover uh, with the class uh, as a whole. Um, and one of them would be fonts. All right. Now, there are certain fonts that are described as web-safe fonts. Web-safe fonts, you can be pretty sure that every browser in the world will have them. Sure is a funny word, right? So, when I say 100% or sure or always, put the word almost in front of it. <laughs> or you almost be sure, all right? Let's look at some web safe fonts.
there's 15 best web safe fonts. Blah, blah, blah. Helvetica, Arial, and they go down the line. So let's go in and let's say body. I'm going to put this on the body tag, which means that since everything's in the body, everything is going to get these fonts. So I'm going to say body. I'm going to say font family. And again, font family is another one of them that has shortcut properties. And I'm going to specify a sequence of fonts. Helvetica, Arial, Sans Serif. Now, here's how this works. The colors, there's no problem with your computer not having the color. All right? But there is a potential problem that your computer won't have a font that you choose to use. All right? That's why you supply multiple fonts. Not your computer, but I mean a user's computer. That's why you supply multiple fonts. The browser looks for each of these fonts on the machine, and if it finds it, it uses it. If not, it goes on to the next font. If it made it all the way end to, the, to the end of the list, it would use the browser's default, which typically is Times New Roman on a Windows machine. All right? Now, sans serif, though, is not the name of a specific font. Most browsers have a default sans serif and serif font. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute here. So what this is going to do is it's first going to look for Helvetica. If it finds it, cool, it will use it. If it doesn't find it, it will use Arial. If it doesn't find either of those, it will use the generic sans serif font. So, it used um, Arial. Uh, I'm thinking Arial because Windows machines typically don't have Helvetica on them. Windows, in fact, Microsoft, in fact, invented Arial because they didn't want to pay the licensing for Helvetica, and so they copied it. All right? Um, which goes to show if you copy in this class, you get a bad grade. If you copy in the corporate world, you can make millions or billions, all right? I didn't make the rules, right? What is all this business about serif and sans serif? A serif, and again, if you're really interested, you can look it up, but serifs are little things on the end of letters. Let's go to Times New Roman, which is a serif type font. So let's make it really big. So if I type an A in a serif font, notice these little thingies right here at the, at the bottom of the A. Little thingy over there at the, uh, the, at the size of the B the little thingies here on the M, and so on. Those are serif letters. This is a serif font, all right? If I go to sans serif, and if we look, no Helvetica. All right, but we have Ariel. There's none of those little dealies on the end of the letters. Sans is simply the French word for without. So sans serif means without serifs. And serifs are those little things on the end. Those actually help identify letters and, and some and increase the readability. What, what criteria would you use to select a font? Looks good on your page. Yeah, you're right. Looks good on the page is right. But if we break that down a little bit further, 
it comes to those two things. I don't remember who said what. But you said readability. Got to be able to read it, right? And it, it should fit the content of your page. Like you would not have a serious page. For a funeral director, you would not use Comic Sans as the font, all right, or something like that. I, I hope that wasn't a, a bad taste example. All right. For a CPA, you shouldn't use Comic Sans there. That's a little more. Um. What about readability? Uh, what you see in many cases is use of serif fonts on headlines and sans serif fonts in uh, like the body of the text. All right, so that's sort of a common sort of combination that you'll see. All right, uh, using fonts is like using colors. Right, uh, it's okay to use more than one. You know, in this example, we only have white. We only have silver, really, but it's okay to use more than one. You don't have to have everything on the page the same font, but if you use too many, it looks like a ransom note, right? Because you're just you have all different kinds of letters for everything. So I'm going to go in, and uh, I'm going to set the the headings to be have a different font, but everything else I'm going to use this font for. So I'm going to go in, where's my CSS? Yeah, go ahead. Can you do like body, header, nav, section, footer, just comma, and then one line? Yeah, you can. Line? You can. Uh, that, that saves a little bit, and that allows you to change everything all at once and all that. Remember this, though, the body will take care of everything in there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to code the exception. So I'm going to do it a, a little bit different way. Do you just delimit it with a comma? Yes. Okay. So let's, what serif font should we use? I like, let's use Korea New. Nah, I don't like that one. I like Garamond. Is that on? Yeah, here we go. Now, this is very subjective, but doesn't that look a lot nicer than that? I think it does. All right. Uh, I realize it's subjective, but here's one thing I want to say, and I'll go and do this fine. Family. And I say this to all my students, especially like in some of the advanced web development classes where the programming is the critical thing, you know, about paying attention to uh, appearance and little things. You know, you spend an extra half hour just sweating the details and making sure you change the default font and putting padding in. You know, that's what I see on a lot of things. People will omit the padding and stuff is run right up against the end of the box. It looks horrible, all right? You just spend a little bit of time just like making it look good and elevating it from like being like, eh, mediocre to oh, pretty good. You can, with a minimal effort, make it look pretty good, all right? Or if you go even beyond that, you can make it look great. So I guess what I'm saying is take the little bit of the time. Don't think, like, what is the absolute minimum amount of time I can get this assignment done in. Take that and add an hour to it, and you'll be amazed how much better your projects are, all right? So if we look at this, I kind of like that, all right? Won't say it's, it's perfect, won't win any design uh, uh, awards, but every little iteration we're making it look a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, all right? Um, that's all I had for today, unfortunately. I, I uh, you know, 
I, I don't record my other classes this semester, so you can't check the recordings. I was going to say, this is, one, this is always one of my favorite classes to teach. It seems like the time lecture goes by so quick. Uh, and if I recorded my other classes, you can listen to see if I say that in all my classes. But this one definitely is, is a class that just goes by too quick. Uh, if you have other questions about how to do something we could talk about in lab, we'll do more CSS stuff to make this look better. And then we'll go and say, okay, here's our prototype. Let's make another version of the prototype that you could use as a basis of comparison. So you can say, I like this, or this, this part of this one, this part of this one, and so on. All right, I'll go and unlock the door, and then I'll be in lab. I'll come back here to get all my files, and then I'll be in lab. Did you do it? I did not.